and um, I'm going to go over just the quick agenda um, slide. So we'll just kind of go over general information, personal introductions. Up, oh, sorry. And then we'll have Alex discuss his work, and Peter will discuss his work, and then kind of closing remarks. And at the end of each artist presentation, if you have questions, comments, you are more than welcome to just chime in at that point. So background, the board members, Susan Kegel and Larry Laffrey worked in collaboration with the Nantes at the museums and the artists from the local tribes to stage an outdoor exhibit at the Musée de l'Histoire Naturelle de Nantes. And originally, as I believe everybody here may know, um, that exhibit initially was going to be taking place inside the museum, but due to coronavirus, um, we came up with a solution to have it out, um, the artwork exhibited outdoors. And then um, hopefully next year, when we are able to observe the 40th anniversary, um, that artwork will be indoors. Um, anybody want to chime in on that process? Well, I guess I would, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this um, that I didn't realize until later was, you know, we had originally planned this exhibit trying to make it easy to ship works to France. And so we had thought really in terms of prints, things that were light and flat and easy to ship. But when we switched to this new format, it became clear that we could open it up to a much broader range of works. So I was really excited to see some of the masks and wood carvings and uh, one of the artists uh, submitted a photo of a drum, things like that, that would have been a little bit harder for us to do in person. So that was kind of fun. Interesting upside to the new format. And I know, Alex, you were there watching it being installed. What was that process like? Or any comments on that? Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, as of right now, actually, the, the entire museum itself is closed. They're actually renovating um, a lot of the exhibits inside. So they have a, uh, they have a full team there that's doing heavy installation of uh new exhibits and and completely redoing their av technology and all of that um so it's pretty easy to to kind of just pull aside two or three uh people there and say hey we want you know this art here and we want this one here and they just came in and um pretty much just installed it in their in their off time uh while they were um uh, in the process of sort of re redoing the whole museum. Um, and so for, from, from this image, you can actually see the, the garden itself. So we have, um, we have some of them basically on that fence that goes uh, on the side you're looking at and then the two sides, uh, the two streets adjacent to the museum. Um, and then they're also currently installing some on the uh, entrance to the museum, which is actually the far side of the building. Awesome. Thank you. Any other final comments? Delightful. All right, next slide. I don't think we particularly need it, um, but in general, as, as if you've been on any Zoom meetings, it's always helpful to be muted when you're not talking in order to eliminate exterior sounds and potential echoes. Um, we don't need to really worry about raising hands because it's a small enough group, I don't think needed. Um, there, this is a tribal map and I'm going to be putting the link to this presentation um, up on our Facebook and also email it out to our members. But there, um, this is an um, awesome resource that um, Larry had shared um, looking at the um, different tribes within 
Washington State. And down at the bottom, they're numbered. And then down at the bottom, they're highlighting different artists, which is um, really um, great. And then also um, a Canadian website um, looks at the different tribes. And you can look at the territories, the languages, the treaties, um, and just the overlapping of that. But what's really important, I think, definitely as um, people that are not part of the indigenous community is recognizing the overlapping of the lands um, and the shared waters of the different tribes, which you can see um, throughout here, which is super important from a very, from a European perspective of understanding of land. So um, there. And um, Alex McCarty, you are our first representative. I want to thank you for your willingness not only to participate in this project and bringing your art to Nault, but also your willingness to share your perspective um, and your art with us today. Um, if you'd like to just kind of do a, I guess, a brief intro about you and your art, that would be awesome. Do you want me to stop sharing the screen while I do that, or what would you prefer, Alex? Well, um... Are we going to just have a quick um, to uh, have uh, Peter and I quickly introduce ourselves and then kind of get get into um, yeah us talking yeah. so maybe I'll stop sharing as you both do a kind of a quick little introduction to yourself so yeah um, so my name is Alex McCarty for those of you that don't know me and I'm from the Macaw Nation up in uh, Nia Bay Washington and. It's the furthest northwest tip point of Washington State, and so when you saw the macaws up there, up, up at the tip of Washington, uh, those areas are our borderlands. Um, and so uh, we call ourselves Quidditch which means people of the rocks and the seagulls. Uh, we got the macaw name uh, from uh, the Clallams, uh, that means uh, generous or well-fed. And I grew up in Nia Bay until I was about 21, I believe. And I moved to Olympia, Washington to go to college uh, to be an educator. So I have my master's in teaching degree. And I've been uh, teaching at the Evergreen State College for about uh, seven years. And so the work I do um, it's inspired uh, by my own research and you know my own my own ways that I culture keep uh, for the for um, you know the work that I do uh, in my professional art and it also um, relates into at the college and so um, the um, what was I going to say? Well, anyways, that's a quick quick introduction. Marvelous, thank you very much. And Peter, would you like to share a little bit about you? Sure. Hello, my name is Peter Boom. I'm a member of the Upper Skagit tribe. And on that map, we are interior Salish, closer to the Canadian border. Or we're Coast Salish, but we're on the interior of the Salish Sea. Um, as far as uh, my artwork goes, similar to what Alec is say, saying, it, it is a reflection of my research and about my own story. I grew up on the Northern Ute Reservation, which is in the Southwest. And then I was in the Army for several years and moved back home um, in my, in my mid-20s. I have a Master's in Environmental Studies, and I'm also a lawyer. So I have my Juris Doctorate on top of that. Um, I do a number of things besides, uh, I'm a half-time artist, and then the other half of the time I'm, I do, uh, I split that time evenly between being an attorney, a mediator, and I also teach, and I've been teaching for the last about nine or, nine or 10 years now um, at the college level, and I teach a wide range of, of uh, topics. So m my work is, I'm a Coast Salish artist, and I've, I've traveled the world with that. Been very fortunate. The reception has been been very blessed with the reception of the work. And I base it 
both on historical um, historical stories from my tribe, but also on what's whatever's happening right now in in either uh, the world or my life or what's happening um, in the contemporary times. So I think that should be enough for now. Awesome, thank you very much. All right. Well, I'd just like to blurt in here for a moment yeah. if I could. Please. Uh, I uh, first had a conversation with Peter uh, in December at Daybreak Star and uh, that was the beginning of our getting him involved with this project and uh, so I really appreciate his staying with me and uh, through all kinds of tribulations as this has gone back and forth. Uh, I have known Alex much longer and uh, I first met him at Nia Bay for Macaw Days 10 years ago and uh, remember having a great conversation with him and have um, bought a few small pieces from him and his daughter over the years and seen him here and there at various shows and uh, last time we met was uh, the opening night of the new Burke Museum where he was uh, uh, carving a halibut dish in uh, a tent set up outside the museum and uh, so we've had a little bit of a relationship over the years and uh, again as with Peter just uh, delighted that uh, he's been willing to be involved in this project and uh, Hopefully, as this matures over the next year or so, um, going to have some wonderful outcomes with it. So I just wanted to jump in with that before our artists talk about their work particularly. Thanks. Oh, thank you. That is wonderful. All right. So, um, Alex, if you would like to... Share your begin talking. Is this are we have the two? We have two images. I'm not sure which one you would like to speak to first, or if you would like to use these, or do you want me to um, make you host so you can pull up your slides? It would be great if I could be host for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Oops. So you should now be able to. Oh, I see it. Yep. Perfect. And so this is the oh, halibut bowl. I I remember Larry, you wanted to. You were wondering <laughs> if you had it finished. Uh, like, to I, where I, <laughs> I have the abalone inlay, and then um, you can see the little tail. Oh, marvelous! What a nice bookend to that meeting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And so it, it's turning out really great. Um, and so um, I just thought I'd show just a few slides. Um, can folks see the screen okay? Yeah. And so um, this is a, uh, photograph of the um, the bay there uh, at the McCanyan Reservation and this is a picture of one of my model canoes that I make and so I wanted to make it look like it was like a full-size canoe the way that that we would put them up on the beach um, and so just to kind of give you an idea of uh, the work that I do um, it, it's it spans across many different mediums and so I learned how to make the these model canoes from my cousin Aaron Parker, who he learned how to make the model canoes uh, from our grandfather Jerry McCarty. And so he would make model canoes as well as full full size canoes. And so the the canoe making was an important component of uh, our um, our uh, Macaw identity. And um, this this is a um, a map where you can see where we're, we're uh, kind of at the bottom of the map here. Um, in, um, uh, you can see the macaw 
uh, we're actually part of the New Channels people. And so uh, we're the most Southern uh, village of the New Channels. And so we, we speak uh, like uh, the dialect is, um, it's uh, Waukeshaan and it's, it's a different language from uh, the Coast Salish uh, or, or the, the Haida, you know, up, uh, up above the Kwak Kwakiwak. And, and so we're, we're kind of separated um, uh, by these different languages that are then connected to family ties across uh, the, the different tribes. And so this is a, a map of um, the Nia Bay uh, reservation. And uh, when I say, you know, that uh, we're the, uh, the Quidditch, the Quidditch Chuck, that, that means that our identity is is directly connected to our environment where we live. And so when we talk about the, the people of the rocks and the seagulls, it, we're, we're specifically talking about the Cape Flattery is what is known today. And we have these, these beautiful, you know, 100 foot rock cliffs and sea caves. And those sea caves became natural environments uh, for the, the seal hunting and the whale hunting. You could see there's a whale down there in that, the bottom. And so the environment that, that we uh, live in, our natural resources were really important and was a direct connection to our identity that we have today. Um, and so the, um, this is a really good picture to show that you know, the macaw were uh, people of the ocean. We used ocean as a highway. And so a lot of my work that I do directly connects to my heritage of where I come from and through like a direct uh, uh, connection uh, to uh, the ocean. And so I, I also grew up on the ocean as a fisherman. We would go out, you know, 50, 60 miles offshore uh, to uh, hunt the, the king salmon um, as well as the halibut and black cod. And so we, I, I grew up out in the ocean and so that that became part of my identity and, and, and shows in my work as well. Um, when I first started my uh, career as an, as an artist and a historian, um, I, I had a chance to work uh, uh, at the Macaw Museum up in Nia Bay. And so I worked with um, the, uh, the curator at the time, uh, his, his name is uh, Greg Arnold. And he um, hired me to, to work with him on this project to make an Ozette village. And so everything was eight, eighth of an inch uh, to a foot scale. And so we made all these little, um, these, uh, these miniature long houses and all these activities on the beach where you see on the bottom that they successfully caught a whale and they're uh, pulling it to shore. And, you know, as the tide goes out. And so we, um, that really, Kind of sparked that that interest in um, uh, learning about uh, the the macaw history, which nat naturally gets incorporated into my work, and so I, that was back in 1994 uh, when we made that that permanent exhibit, and um, it's part of the introductory of the macaw museum, and so um, the the work that I did here. Um, it, it inspired me to uh, go into education and to uh, be a history and art teacher because the, those two combined, it's, it's really crucial in the, like the work I do uh, of uh, like de decolonizing curriculum. And, and so uh, it's, it's been uh, um, like an excellent connection and kind of that what got me started and what I do today what I'm talking about today. And so uh, that Ozet, you know, that, that was um, actually a dig site. They call it like the Pompeii of uh, Washington or Pompeii of the Northwest, uh, where there was a mudslide that covered uh, like several uh, homes of the Macaw people. And so they dug up, uh, carefully dug up uh, five of those homes. So they were really looking for the like the chief or the leader of that village's home and they were able to find that home and then that's when they stopped the digging because they, they were able to find those treasures and to have a really good sense on how our societies were built 
And so that's kind of about the Ozet uh, in, in connection with my, my own identity because my grandmother, Matilda Johnson was from the Ozet village. She, she grew up out there until she was about 10 years old. And then they, um, they made our family move back to, um, or they made them move to the main village in Nebe so that they could go to school, so that she, she could go to the school. And so uh, they, once they moved away from Lizette, <laughs> it actually became a national park. <laughs> and, so now, and now no, nobody can live out there. And so, um, like the, the work I do is directly connected to visual narrative. And so this is a piece that I made back in 2017 when I was over in New Zealand working with Maori artists in Aotearoa. And uh, I made this piece, uh, it's, it's the whale hunter. It's the, the original whale hunter, the Thunderbird. And so a lot of our work uh, incorporates the Thunderbird because the Thunderbird taught the macaws uh, the technology of whale hunting that, that they used for as far back as they could remember, they connected it to learning from the Thunderbird and how, how to make their own uh, harpoons. And the Thunderbird used sea serpents, uh, or they're called like the lightning snakes, uh, for, uh, for his harpoons to catch the whale. And so the macaws learned that from Thunderbird. And so the, the advanced technology that, that we've had um, is is um, a place that that particular narrative, and so this this is what I could just imagine what the Thunderbird would look like uh, ca capturing the whale, and that's what the macaws observed uh, in uh, this particular piece. And of course, in the Pacific Northwest, it may be nice out now, but it it primarily rains in the Northwest. <laughs> and so I, I do incorporate a, a lot of rain in my work. Um, and so this is a piece that uh, uh, is, is shared uh, uh, with you today. Uh, and this is a, uh, it's, it's actually a design that was passed to me from my father and my mother. Uh, and uh, they wanted to um, uh, really, uh, I guess, uh, create a narrative of where my family comes from. And so my, my grandfather, it, what, he, he was the last uh, whale hunter in my immediate family. And he, he, he would be the one uh, that was a lancer. And so I have uh, these old, uh, they, they were reel-to-reel uh, -reel that were um, put to tape. And then I put, put them into a digital uh, media so that we can put them on CDs or we can share them digitally. But he would talk about how he, uh, uh, when he was about 20 years old, you know, around the turn of the century, that the macaws, they, they were still like out, out there whale hunting and he, he would go out hunting and he would say that um, they would leave uh, the beach about nine o'clock at night and they would paddle straight into the ocean until morning. And once they got, um, as far as they could by the morning time, uh, that's where uh, they, they would hunt the whale. And it was probably, um, it's, it's about 25 miles offshore. Um, if like, if, if you left the Wyatch area or the ocean side of Nia Bay and went straight in straight out, um, you would uh, find uh, that there's a, even today, there's a lot of the humpback whales out there. And so you'll, uh, th those are the macaws. They're the favorite. They they taste better than uh, the gray whales, is what people say. And so that's that's where they would go and hunt the humpback whales. Where the gray whales actually stay closer to shore, and um, they have a little better access to them. But they would use the gray whale for like the lamp oil. They would they they would uh, get the oil from the, um, but they like to eat the the humpbacks. And so um, this was a lino cut. So I incorporated carving because I'm a carver. Um, I, uh, I was a carver before a printmaker. And so when I, when I started printmaking, um, I incorporate carving techniques in, in to, to the print work that I do, particularly with the relief uh, carving that you see here. And so um, let's see. 
And this is another one that um, that I shared shared with you folks. Um, this is inspired by a, um, a a basket design. And so my my grandmother Matilda Johnson, she was a master basket weaver, and um, I've I kind of dabble with weave, weaving a little bit. I, I, I can use cedar bark and I could make like, I, I made a cedar bark, um, like a canoe hat um, and I can make um, uh, the, the, a spiral weave basket, but it's not nearly as in intricate as, you know, when they do the, the fine, uh, I think it's called like twining, the twining type of weaving. And, um, and so that's what they would have is it's called a successful whale hunt. And this is when the, um, the whale was already caught and you could see the, the whale is pulling three float bags and uh, it's connected to uh, the um, canoe. And so that's when um, the, the canoe is actually being towed by the, the whale. And they, at that point, the, uh, you know, the, the people in the canoe, like the, the pullers, they sing a song that, um, like um, uh, kindly ask the whale to, to tow them to shore and not out to the ocean where they'll 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 most certainly die, and and so that uh, that that actually can happen where the whale like naturally kind of wants to pull them out 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 to the ocean um, in some cases, and so it's it's a really interesting. Um, research that I looked into the symbolism behind these these pieces and so at the bottom you can see that triangle pattern that's what the um, the land looks like how far away uh, that uh, you would go out into the ocean to to catch the the humpback whales that's that's what the landscape looks like and so you could kind of have an idea you know because probably about 30 I think it's about 30 35 miles the uh, the the curvature of of the um, the world you stop seeing land a, a after that and so you, so they're they're probably roughly between you know fifteen to twenty miles offshore I'm imagining and then these diamond shapes are float bags and so they they would um, have these float bags and they would um, represent like how many uh, generations they can date back a, a direct lineage of the of people that were whale hunters in their family. And then this is a piece um, that I, I titled Remember Where You Come From. And this is uh, inspired by uh, the, the old, uh, the ancient petroglyphs that are out by Ozet. It's called Wedding Rock. And so these petroglyphs, they were, um, their visual documentation of um, of things that people saw and so um, I had uh, uh, you know the, they have this uh, sailing ship and uh, they had this this dog uh, that had um, this this person that was uh, holding a gun it looks like he's holding a gun and so when when people they they never saw that before they thought it was really strange they documented it in in, uh, in uh, these types of petroglyphs and so um, where, you know, my, my grandmother, she was from uh, Ozette. And so um, to, I wanted to incorporate uh, the, the petroglyph work in, into my uh, prints. And so this, um, this silhouette behind is actually a silhouette of the Macaw Indian Reservation. And uh, it, it looked like a silhouette of a bear. And so uh, I, I was th thinking about, you know, how, um, like what our Macaw Indian Reservation uh, could, could look like from that aerial point of view or from a bird's eye view. And I, I thought it was really interesting. And so um, my, my uh, grandfather, Jerry McCarty, um, and, and his father, Hishka, uh, they they were uh, uh, from the Wyatch Village, which is um, kind of like uh, I don't know if folks can see my mouse, um, but it's it's right. Whoops, it's kind of right at um, 
where that little dog, where his nose is point, pointing, like the little orange dog that's kind of barking. So that he's he's pointing straight straight towards the Wyatch Village, and um, and so uh, that's where Hish, Hishka was from. He was the 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 last chief of that village uh, before um, they they kind of stopped the the potlatch protocol due to like assimilation and signings of the treaty like you know over 150 years ago and so um this this is a piece uh, that i did back in 2000 actually and it goes into the detail um where where hishka he would be the one uh, at the the head of the canoe where he's holding the harpoon getting ready uh, to catch the whale and so that would be my great grandfather Ishka, and then the the person holding the float bag uh, uh, is uh, uh, my grandfather Jerry McCarty, and uh, he he would be the lancer uh, where he would throw spears at the whale <laughs> after the whale was caught. It sounds gruesome, but it was an and it was a really important part of the society because they were able to feed everybody in the society. And, and so they didn't just take care of their, you know, their immediate family, they took care of everybody. And when they would go out, there would be several canoes. And then if, if one canoe caught the whale, they would all help. They'd all help to tow the whale to shore. And then everybody got, got a part of that. And so it really helped with community building. And then um, and sometimes they would have to tow the whale for, um, for uh, many miles. And so uh, you see at the um, at the back, the helmsman, the, the person standing up, that would be my great grandfather Arthur Johnson, and he was from Ozette, and he would he would be the one that would uh, swim. He'd swim down into the water and he'd tie the mouth up so that the because like the humpback whales, they have great big mouths, and if their mouths weren't tied shut, they would just sink just just uh, in a short period of time and so they would ha they would have to go down there and tie the mouth shut to to keep that whale from sinking so that was a really important um uh position and he even way my dad said that way after uh you know that the macaws didn't whale anymore they agreed not to whale due to like limited you know whale populations and so they want they always want to honor their their resources and you know and and be stewards you know of of uh, the land in the ocean uh but he would still practice where he would like grab a rock and he'd walk out in to the wyatch uh bay and go as walk out into the water as far as he could and then and come back uh without letting go of the rock and so he still practiced those those uh conditionings like well, well into you know being an elder in a society, because it was an important part of his life, and so he would, but being under the water all the time, it he had trouble hearing, and so he, uh, uh, he had wa like water damage in his ears, and so he was like super loud. My dad said he could hear him like three three doors away when, when he he says when <laughs> when my grandpa would laugh and and talk. It's like you could hear him like two or three houses down. It was like he knew where he was. <laughs> but the work that I do, it's it's directly you know connected to to my heritage, uh, and, you know, and and as a as a culture keeper. And so I always have a visual narrative, um, you know, with, with an artist statement that that speaks to that work and and speaks to that connection. And so I probably used up all my time. I imagine. Are are we okay? And so this is a picture that I took out on the ocean um, as the sun was going down. And so um, you can go to my website. It's Alexander Swiftwater McCarty, Maca Art. It's, it's the um, alexmccarty.org. And so I have an online portfolio. And uh, to kind of show some of the carvings that I do. Um, and so I just just kind of like thinking about this this digital world that we're in, and this this re remote um, connections that we're having, uh, that the um, the print work would would you know really connect well with with the work that we're doing here today. And so I 
I thank you for you you know for providing me the opportunity to speak speak about my work uh, in 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 con connection to this really cool show that you have like it's such an amazing idea to have you know the like like a, a garden ex exhibition where you know because folks folks interact in that space wh whether the museum is open or not and so I'm I'm uh, part I'm on the um, uh, the uh, 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 kind of like a, affiliated with the uh, the Wa the Washington State History Museum in Tacoma, and then so they're they're mounting an ex exhibition, and of course the museum is closed. And I was like, I have this cool idea that somebody's doing over in France. What do you think about that? And they're like, That's amazing. <laughs> And so these connections are moving in different directions. And so, so th thank you for this opportunity. No, thank you. That was wonderful. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I'm sure everybody here did as well. Um, any questions, for Alex, before we move on? I have one. Oops. You go ahead, Alex. You're muted, Alex. We we can't hear you, Alex. You're muted. There you go. Still can't hear you. Let me see if I can. That's. Should I do unmute? Um, I pushed unmute on it. Okay. Like I can hear you. Um, because oh, Alex. Actually, we have question. two Alexes. I think this is the source of the confusion. <laughs> You're talking about Alex in France, yes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It that's it was super funny because I was having the same trouble yesterday in one of my Zoom meetings that the mic was come kind of going in and out. Um, Alex, um, Theo, you can type your can you type your question in the chat? Well, while we're waiting, I'll you throw mine it. in, which was I, was, I was curious about the uh, program that you're teaching at the um, Evergreen State College, the Place Memory Narrative Program, and wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that and what kinds of students you're getting. Yeah, I teach that program about every three years. And so the um, it's focused on um, like contemporary Northwest Coast art. And so I teach printmaking. And so I teach screen printing. I teach relief, like, uh, like woodcut, lino cut and, um, and monotype prints. And so um, I, I teach visual narrative and, and how uh, our environment influences our identities. And so uh, it, and then so that's why um, we focus on place, memory, and narrative. And, and so a, a lot of, of the memories um, are embedded in, uh, in the oral traditions of, the, of, of, the, of the, the indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest. And so we, we really get into um, uh, how important those, those narratives are uh, for the identity of, of, of the people that live in a particular area. Because in many cases, you'll find uh, that there might be a dominant society coming in um, and, and writing their own history about that place. Um, and and uh, the, the people, they may uh, be like a, a minority group, their voice is no longer heard. And so there's ways that, you know, where it's, it's really kind of through decolonization and, and providing a platform uh, for, for those people uh, to to be able to 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 speak to their to their own identities to speak to what's important to them, 
in many different capacities. And so it, it, it gets into like, uh, like, like Pacific Northwest history, like Pacific Northwest indigenous history, as well as, uh, you know, things that are going on contemporary today, like, like thinking about food sovereignty and like, you know, like indigenous diets. And so when, when they adopt that, like a, a Western diet of, of food that you go from, get from the grocery store, um, it, it's actually re really bad for, for their health and cause all these different complications. Uh, and, and so just, those are the kind of things that we kind of focus on and just, and then kind of relate that to, to whatever um, is happening to today, you know, it, you know, and so, you know, st students bring, bring these, these in, into, you know, and they might be difficult things to talk about, uh, uh, but we, we try to set a, a safe environment for, for them to think about these different things and, and to, you know, it, it encourages them to be advocates as well and to be advocates for, for themselves. And, and so it's, that's kind of what, what that program is all about. And so we, we taught it three years ago and then we, we, we taught it this year. And, and so, um, it's, it's we we keep fine kind of fine tuning the the curriculum but it's it's been great i i do enjoy teaching that great question susan excellent explanation alex that's really cool as a fellow teacher i find that fascinating so very cool um any other final thoughts before we uh, i was yeah jean luc yeah, I was uh, wondering about the uh, petroglyphs, but uh, you know, when were they made and were they placed in such a way that they can be seen from the ocean? Is there a, a symbolism there or uh, a reason for their placement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine um, they're like some of them are clearly from. Um, the, the the time of um, uh, con like European contact or like the beginning of European interactions because on on some of them it's called wedding rock and and you could look up like Ozette petroglyphs online and there's a lot of documentation about it and I have books as well I, I could share some re resources on specific books that talk about that as well um, but the um, like one of them is a sailing uh, it's it's an obvious sailing ship, and so uh, the Makazi really didn't know what those sailing ships were because they they stayed pretty far off because there there's a reef that extends at least you know several miles out, and so when the when those sailing ships would be passing by, the Makazi really didn't know what they were, and so they would document it on the on that rock, saying that I saw this particular object, like like flying out in the ocean because it because they with the directional like they when they got in closer they thought they were like go like ghosts um or it, it, it would so they really didn't know what it was at first and so i'm imagining it's probably like you know like the it was like 1780s i ish or, you know that that those petroglyphs probably date date back to the 1700s i'm i'm imagining and then um there was one that clearly has uh, somebody holding a rifle and like sh and pointing a rifle and then there's a dog kind of barking and so that that's the barking dog that I have in in my petroglyph piece um, and th that I kind of move move that forward because dogs are actually a really important part of the the macaw ozet and as well as co Salish societies because they would keep those little dogs they were these little white kind of lap dogs that grew really long white hair and they would harvest that hair and they would incorporate it into these these really beautiful blankets that were they were pure white blankets that were like highly sought after in that like the potlatch economy and so when people could make those uh, you know it it would kind of move them up through a hierarchical system and so like like weaving was really important part part of our societies um, and so that's, so those, those petroglyphs are really a way of showing like how um, indigenous people have, have used uh, visual narrative in, in documenting specific things that have happened within that environment, 
within that specific area, which becomes a landmark. Now, uh, I believe we are seeing a photograph of some of those petroglyphs in the background. <laughs> I should say that, that my family used to go with Boy Scouts every single year um, backpacking at Lake Cosette. It was a favorite, favorite backpack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, is, this is a photograph from 11 years ago, from April of 2009. And uh, it just gives you a little sense of the scale and, and uh, a little glimpse of the locale. Yeah. And by the way, the museum in OZ is amazing. So when, when it reopens, you should all go. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. And thank you. Good job. Um, Andy, for finding that picture <laughs> through your <laughs> filling that up and great questions. I think it's about time to move on to Peter. Before that, um, Ox McCarty, could you maybe make me host again? That way I can share my screen. I should have changed the settings beforehand. But... Oh, yeah, I'm host now. Never mind. Good. Thank you. All righty. If I could just interject really quickly. Yes, please. Um, so one thing to note about the, uh, one thing that I forgot to mention earlier, one thing to note about the garden that uh, all of these, um, uh, that all of this art is surrounding is that it's actually a community garden. So here in Nantes, there's about 30 or 40 uh, green spaces throughout the city that are specifically identified as community uh, gardens. So uh, in the middle of this garden is actually a large, basically just a large soil patch that people uh, come in from the community and they'll plant strawberries, they'll plant, you know, vegetables, they'll plant fruit, they'll plant whatever, uh, you know, grows natively in this area. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a very um, popular area for people to stroll through, for people to come and take care of. And so I know during the installation of a lot of these things we had people all the time coming up and saying you know oh what are you guys doing and we'd you know explain the exhibit to them we had the um city a couple city police officers were just strolling around checking parking tickets you know giving out uh parking tickets and of course they were walking along the street that we were installing photos on and we had a lengthy conversation with them about the exhibit so it really is a very sort of community centered garden um, and I think that draws a lot of a lot of people to it who then um, look at the the art displayed there. Well, cool. thanks for that added context. All right, and Peter, are you ready to share? Oh. Sure. I I didn't prepare anything to share on that the screen. Is so totally fine. <laughs> Your presence is more than enough. <laughs> All right, let me pull up the first. And, and I forgot which images I put into this yeah, show. Yeah, so. uh, here you should see, you see the image up yep. there? Yep, okay. This is a, um, so I'm a Coast Salish artist. Um, my, my father was a, member of the Quinault tribe, which is just south of Alex's tribe on the coast. And so I often incorporate stories, family stories from uh, my Quinault side as well, uh, even though I'm Upper Skagit. And um, so this here, we, I've got two salmon, and this is about life cycle. Uh, and I use negative space an awful lot because historically, Salish work was the negative space was just as important as the positive space, primarily because a lot of the things that we did were on utilitarian surfaces. So you're decorating something that was an important object of use of survival. And so the object that you're that you're putting an image on is oftentimes more important than the image itself. It's like painting your car. It doesn't matter what color the paint is if the car doesn't run. So I, I make sure that I keep 
I keep that in mind when I'm designing things, even if it's a flat surface such as this. This is a canvas painting. I actually have it here in my studio with me. Um, yeah, I can grab it real quick if you, just a second. So it's a fairly small canvas piece. Um, if I, yeah, you can see. And what I was, I did this piece in um, earlier. I'm not sure if I designed it in December or January or November. Um, I spent a lot of time in the hospital this last over the last 18 months. Uh, my, my brother passed away last year and I spent a lot of time with him before he passed away. And then uh, my father passed away in January and he was in the hospital for about three months. And um, while I was sitting there with him and he wasn't able to speak, I, I designed an awful lot. I spent a lot of time drawing. And this piece I wanted to design because it was the, life cycle of salmon and, uh, and I was sitting there watching, watching my father and spending time with him and I was realizing that it's a natural um, progression of life. And so no matter which way you look at this piece, you have, you have life, you have life coming and going both. And in the negative spaces, I have uh, birds who are feeding upon the, the, the bodies of salmon as they spawn and they go back and they put that life into their surroundings. I have insects in this, um, in this piece and it's all about the continuation of, of life because that's what salmon really represent is this whole cycle of continuation. And so for this, so this piece is a bit personal for me, but it's also about the idea that we continue that even through hardships, even through times, that we continue. And so that's what this piece was, was um, about. And, um, and in between the two salmon, you have uh, water. So, yeah. I did this piece about 10 years ago, I believe. Uh, I wanted to do a, a straightforward, traditional style sailage piece. And these are king salmon as they're swimming upstream. Uh, the symbols on the top and bottom are water, uh, kind of like a ripple, ripple effect. And these are, are salmon as they head upstream to do their thing. I don't really have a lot to say about this piece other than it was just a straight traditional sailage piece and I was, I incorporate salmon a lot in my work as my father was a lifelong fisherman. My father-in-law is a fisherman. Um, I come from a long, long line of fishermen and I am unable to, I wouldn't be able to make a living as a fisherman now. We just don't have the salmon stocks available there. We just don't environmentally uh, salmon are on the decline and have been. And so I'm the first, in a long line of, of uh, fishermen who would, even if, I, even if I wanted to, and I've fished uh, many times uh, for years, but I couldn't make a living doing it now. And so I incorporate that idea or that frustration into my work pretty regularly. And my, my children, there's no way they'd be able to make a living fishing. And my sons have only been fishing with their grandfathers. I, I've never taken them fishing myself as a, as a commercial fisherman. So these are things that, that we think about pretty regularly and that, um, that I address in the work. Yeah. I'm not gonna take as much time as Alex. I didn't, I didn't bring as much uh, material. 
but um what what you shared was more than sufficient and it's delightful um are there ignore this are there any questions <laughs> i yes forgive forgive my ignorance but i would love if we could go back to the first piece peter mm -hmm. you were talking about shapes in the negative space oh i just saw a bird okay i was going to okay. ask you if you could help me see more of what's in there okay because yeah, I have we, terrible trouble with negative space we can we can definitely do that so if i go from the top left corner if we're going left to right yeah, so uh, so there's a white dot right underneath the uh, dorsal fin that's the eye of a bird in the negative space so you can see the bird shape there you go and the beak as it goes towards the salmon's head. So there's, so that white dot, um, I wish I could. Here, I can, yeah. stand here, I can sh uh, make you host and then yeah. you can. Then I'll move my mouse around. Yeah, yeah, that will work far more sufficiently. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. All right. And then I can show you a couple of other things. Of course, it'll probably show my screen, right? Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, here, let me put the... I can do it on the painting if that's easier. I, you could, yeah, if you want to do that, or I can share, you the, share the presentation with you, whichever works. Yeah. Let's share the presentation. It might be easier for people to see. All right. So I put it... Oops. I do happen to be in my studio, so I, so I have to. Yeah, uh, chats. So if you click on that, maybe. Okay. It's bringing up a Google Doc. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yep. We're good. We're good to go. Awesome. So I will share screen. All right. Does that work for people? Okay. So right here we have an eye and this is a beak as it's the head. And then, um, let's see if I can move this over. I'm gonna move you guys over on this other side. Okay, here we go. And so in the tail, which is, so this is a mirrored image. You have the head, the pectoral fin, the body, and then the tail, and then the dorsal fin, and then the adipose fin here. Um, and then I left out the anal fin and a couple others. So I have the ribs here. This, in Salish work, we use uh, four basic design elements and shapes. We use an S shape, which is right here. We use a circle. We use a crescent. And we use a V cut or a trigon, which is right here. And those are the four shapes that we use. And that, that's it. So we are limited in what we do but it also forces you to focus that very distinctly and specifically uh, so these are the ribs here and then i put a little eye so this is also a fish as it goes the other direction upside down here is the tail but it's also a bird so we have an eye here and the beak it's easier to see on the side here's the here's the eye it's the head of the bird and so these are the feathers as they come back in the negative space here, I have another bird with the beak coming in. Um, I, I turned this into somewhat of an insect. I wasn't, the shape didn't lend itself quite as well, but this is the um, adipose fin, which is clipped in hatchery fish. So if you catch a wild salmon coming back, uh, they have this adipose fin, whereas hatchery fish, they clip it to show that it's a hatchery fish. Uh, 
so this these symbols here this is the ripple of, of water so you can see here would be the center and then the waves come out almost like a sound wave or a water wave and yeah that's that's what we have here with this image um, so salmon and the idea of salmon are important in multiple ways in the Northwest. So one is that they've been our historical staple food um, historically forever. But as a lawyer, they're really important because we, um, we have treaty rights to salmon and to salmon areas. And we, we won one of the most historic and powerful cases, uh, actually a series of cases, it's US, U.S. v. Washington, which is also known as the Bolt Decision. It's an ongoing series of cases over about 40 year period that reaffirmed treaty rights and tribal sovereignty. And part of that reaffirmation is this idea of government to government relations and co-management of natural resources within our treaty lands and treaty areas. And so salmon were the catalyst to um, to really creating this very powerful government to government relationship and in the northwest we are one of the most powerful areas in the united states when it comes to tribal uh, rights and tribal governments and their interaction with the u.s government i i also work with tribes all over the country and they don't have those same treaty rights that we do here uh, the Bolt decision was the, the foundation and the groundwork for a number of other cases around the country that that brought tribes and government to government relationships and consultation and things like that to um, that brought those to bear in other areas of the country. The Great Lakes they have uh, treaties and they just used in their cases they they now also have co-management, but the framework was established by the tribes in the Northwest. And so because of that, uh, because of salmon, they, they're there and they um, really are kind of foundational, both culturally as well as today when it comes to uh, the powers of our tribes and our governments. So. Yeah. Sorry, I just lawyered you. Um, That's good. <laughs> that was fascinating. Were you involved in those cases in the Bolt decision? I do remember hearing about that a few years back. Those, uh, that, the Bolt decision was decided in 1974. So oh, I, okay. I, I was not a lawyer at that time. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I was potty trained yet. Um, <clears throat> But there was something recently I heard, or, or maybe it was about the culverts or yeah, something. Yeah, that's, that's an extension of, that's the culvert case, that's Martinez. I was not involved in that particular case. I, they don't need me for, for that. There's, there are lawyers who have made their careers off of, off of those cases. Um, yes, I, I am involved in water cases in the Southwest right now, but I can't talk about those. <laughs> You're going to lawyer up on us. I, I just, I can't. They're ongoing. I have a multi-billion dollar lawsuit that's coming up any day now. So, um, yeah, I can't talk about it. Sorry. It's not even interesting, so it's not worth talking about. Uh, let's see, how do I turn this back to you? Um, if you go to um, participants. And then you click on my name. See, I think I might be in the wrong thing. There we go. Oh. Um, nope, that's the wrong way. Yep, so click on the participants down at the bottom. I'm not in the right. Uh, or even, um, I can see. Like, oh, here we go. There we go. It's up top. Here we go. And you are. Oops. That's not. Maybe I've click, been doing. Click on the icon down at the very bottom, like when you had your, um, like down where you see the uh, the menu down at the very bottom with all the different applications. 
mm -hmm. click on the Zoom icon from there instead of from the web browser. You see the different. Oh, yep, there we go. That. Yeah, it's the one. Yeah. And then. Nope, that's not the one either. That's all right. I, it'll, I think it, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, there we go. Okay. There we go. What am I trying to do? Give it to you. Yeah. Although, like, we're kind of the end, so it's not the end of the world if I'm host or not, I don't think. Um, you are now host. Cool. Brilliant. Thank you. And um, I just want to thank both you, Alex, and Peter for taking this time, not only in the, all the legwork that went up in creating this exhibit, um, but taking the time to talk to us and allow us to kind of document your stories and narratives that's exhibited through your art. Um, it's much grateful. And I know that when we are able to share this with people, like the people in France um, love native art. And um, I'm not sure, um, did we share, we should share the newsletter that we just put out yesterday um, that has stories and in there, um, we had a group of Nalt Day of students from Nalt that came in February. They're university students, and there were uh, they chose different topics to explore, and one of them was looking at native art. And Susan took them to the Suwamish tribe, correct? Suwamish. Yeah. Yeah. And they one thing that they're in the we did a Zoom meeting with them, and one of their observations was they were surprised that there wasn't more native representation around the city. Um, and it's like, yeah, <laughs> um, because it's something that they, like they are fascinated by. Um, some of which, you know, there's definitely a misrepresentation and image of what native culture is and indigenous culture is. But um, I think that speaks volumes that there does need to be more visual representation of indigenous cultures in Washington and throughout the country and world like it was really cool um alex that you seem like you're, you're working with um indigenous artists in new zealand that's super cool or i learned that from yourself um yeah we'll share that with you because it was interesting to see their perceptions of um native representation um yeah, and you know, I'd also like to say, you know, my my personal thanks to the two of you for participating and hoping that you'll um, participate in the the real show next year when hopefully we can travel and, and take some physical objects. Yeah, I know I'm so looking forward to it. Um, and I know the, um, the director of the museum is going to try and join us this morning, but I think something came up. Um, that, yeah, as Elena mentioned, they're reopening the building next Saturday, so they're all working extraordinarily hard right now. But we will share the recording with him and his staff, and um, I know he will enjoy that very much. They have, they have been so happy, I have to say, with this show, and so excited about, um, you know, having something that, you know, people can look at. It's free, it's available to the, the public and um, just kind of joyous in this time when, you know, we all need something, right? So they're very, very happy about that. Well, and today being August 1st, uh, the beginning of a month where the French famously uh, go on vacation, they seemingly have done that even in the face of a global pandemic. So uh, the fact that we've recorded this today and can be sharing this uh, in future uh, makes me feel great because this was absolutely terrific and Alex Peter I really I'm so thrilled you could be part of this today and share what you did so thank you all right well with that enjoy the rest of your we are all in Seattle now so, or no actually enjoy your evening um, and the rest of the day um thank you so much it was delightful sharing this space with you for the last hour <laughs> anytime thanks for having me all right thank you very much thank you everybody uh, thank you Let's do this again yes this was fun i'm glad <laughs> it was fun for us as well <laughs>